show 365 days of awesome celebrate success through service and right now i need to ask my guest to turn down his, his i'm hearing um I'm hearing our, my voice. And so I don't know if maybe what's going on with the computer, but we're having a little bit of a feedback issue. And so anybody that comes here, we're going to, I'm going to ask for some feedback on the feedback. Uh, so, but let's continue with the show. Uh, this is 365 days of awesome celebrate success through service. We are today going to be visiting with our service hero, Brian Bogert, Brian, is a man that I was actually introduced to by one of my leaders within the organization that I run, Chemo Buddies for Life. She said I needed to meet him. She's met him in her local marketplace. She said, this man is doing a lot for a lot of people and he's serving your community among others. So at the very last minute on Giving Tuesday, we found a spot for him to come in and share Today, we are going to actually be talking about what is happening now, today, April the 9th, in the year 2020, because many of us, all of us throughout the world, are experiencing some changes, some shifting, and it takes perspective to sometimes be able to see how we can together get through this, and that is what Brian's all about, so welcome today to serve thank you very much um I'm, I'm excited to be with you i love what you're doing um i'll ask real quick since you said there was a little feedback has that seemed to eliminate so far yeah, every, everything okay. is perfect now okay, it perfect. sounds perfect yeah, yeah so i'm excited great. for our discussion today because it's uh you know there's a lot of people right now that um, need a lot of help and the only way we yeah. get through this crazy uncertain time is together so exactly exactly and that's why i brought back service heroes because service heroes was on a little bit of a hiatus and and uh, one of my coaches, Jason Cisneros, he had put it out there. Okay, any kind of positive uh, program, any, anything that we can be doing to inspire each other, we need to do it now. So I thought, okay, let's, let's get Service Heroes back and let's really check in with people that are making a difference right now. And that is what you're doing. And I really want to respect also the fact that you're a humble man and you're not going to and i want this on the record everyone we're going to be talking about how brian is making a difference and inspiring others to do so and we're not going to be doing it in a, a bragging way this is an educational way an inspirational way because this man believes in giving back and sometimes the people that do are some of the most humble that i know that's one of the reasons I started Service Heroes, because not always do we hear about these amazing stories and people that are out there currently making a difference on the front lines. And you are. I want to welcome Helene Wilson. Helene, one of our chemo buddies for life, one of my buddies. I'm glad you're here with us today. Brian. Let's talk. You are in the, <laughs> you're right now. And in fact, I had to ask because it's like, okay, are you at a gym? <laughs> and, and you explain to me what? Uh, so this is my home gym. I, you know, I'm, I'm a big believer in environments for success. And I realized a long time ago that I needed to keep myself fit and in shape for a whole variety of reasons, some of which we might unpack, some of which we might not. But the reality of it is, is I don't work well in big box gyms. I don't get motivated well. I don't, I don't have the energy. I don't push myself as hard. And the only thing I can't create more of is time. And so the pure fact, the hurdle of having to get in the car, and even if it was 10 or 15 minutes each direction, by the time I'd get there and get set up, I'd waste 45 minutes or an hour of my day. And so over the course of the last probably eight years, I've been building out my own home gym um, because it's easy. I wake up, I've got everything set. I can go through my routine and I can have that be a part of my morning routine and break a sweat daily. So I really set this up, which now in this time is turning out to be a blessing because so many of my other friends that are big into fitness and keeping themselves mentally, physically, spiritually healthy are having to find new and creative ways to do it. For me, it's still a part of my environment. It's a part of my normal routine. And I've just kind of been able to embrace that. So yeah, it's funny. It fits into everything I do though, because I'm all about just making sure that we're the best versions of ourselves. So your recognition of it, it's funny. I used to be 
questioning whether or not this was my background. And recently, particularly since COVID, everybody's like, I want a gym like that. And I was like, well, you <laughs> that one over the course of five to eight years or even a year, just invest the money and the time and be intentional with it. Right, exactly. And you know, I will say this because we were talking about it and over the years I've had the home gym and then I've let family members take some of the pieces and now I'm putting it back together. I have noticed that if you have stairs, if you have, you know, you could find in your environment, you could be creative That's right. That's right. if you really want to be, uh, you know, fit. Now, you know, I will say there are some exceptions to that rule. And I'm not going to just say blanketly, oh, yeah, you know, if you're in a, a studio apartment and you're not allowed outside of that door, that you're going to have everything you need to make, you know, break the sweat. Except for, you know, you can pretend like you have a jump road or something, right? I mean, you, there's all sorts you, of ways. You can always get creative. And I think, you know, for those who don't have a home gym, right, there's a million body weight exercises that can be done with no other things. And then if you just look at normal household items, too, I fortunately haven't had to do this, but, you know, books can make good weights or good like yoga blocks or, right, you can get creative. Bottles of water can be weights. You can still do some mm -hmm. plyometric stuff. You know, it's been funny, though, that you say that my wife, although we have this gym, doesn't frequently use it herself. She likes to go and some different things. And since we've been in this time of isolation, we'll literally be in the middle of a conversation and she'll just start doing lunges or squats or like, and I'm like, what are you doing? She's like, I'm taking advantage of what's right in front of me. I'm, I'm just going to get some fitness in while we're talking. So I love it. Yes. You know, and, and, and that's the way to think. And, and, um, some of our chemo buddies for life, we were, we were, we've been having a closed group meetings and every day we have a chat and, and we had one that came in and she was talking about her routines. And this is a person that, uh, you know, she's got, she's got a lot of challenges going on right now. She's involved in, in, um, you know, studies and, and she's in active treatment yet. She has a two hour routine that she gets up and she's in her, you know, kitchen and she's yeah. doing exercises on the counter and she's doing all these things because it's the, it's the heart, the mind, the soul, all of it coming They're together with the body. Right. Exactly. Yep. To be able to heal through, this period of time. So I love it. I love it. I love it. Now let's talk. You mentioned possibly unpackaging or not. And I do want to go into some of your past to then bring it to the future and, you know, or to today. Yeah. Uh, when I learned, because I, I knew that there had to be something that I needed to know about you. And I was desperately trying to get all this information. And when I found out, it was like, okay, I am getting it now. You were young. And you had an yeah. accident, right? Mm -hmm. Let's let's talk about that because, and and let me preface this, guys. We right now are in a period of time of what happened, you know, like immediately our day, you know, our, our way of life right now has changed. Let's just be honest; it's slightly different than it was because of an event, a, a, something that is going on in the world. Many people can relate to this because anybody that's heard you have cancer and you work with a lot of people in your area, and we'll talk about that. You, you know, it could be anything that has all of a sudden changed your your environment. When we had that happen, we have choices to make, and and we can we can either learn to get through it and grow through it, or we can not. And you had an experience when you were young yep. and, and I would, th you know, and I'm not going to put the words in your mouth, but when I read this, I was like, okay, I am totally understanding this man much more. So why don't you talk about that? And then we'll yeah. bring, yeah. So I want everybody to just kind of picture for a second, walking out of a store and walking to your car and you're getting ready to unlock it and get in and head home. And you turn your head and see a truck barreling across the parking lot at 40 miles an hour right at you with no time to react. That's kind of where this story starts. My mom and my brother and I went to the store to get a one inch paintbrush. And after we went into the local Walmart, got what we needed, we're heading to the car. I've always had an excitement and a vigor for life. So I was no doubt a few feet in front of them. Mm -hmm. I got to the car first and my mom and brother were a few feet behind me. As I was standing there waiting for her to unlock the doors, a truck pulled up in front of the Walmart um, that we had just walked out of. And the driver and the middle passenger got out. 
The passenger all the way to the right felt the truck moving backwards, so he moved over to put his foot on the brake, but instead hit the gas. Uh, Combination of shock and force threw him up onto the steering wheel, and I know now you all know and see where this is going. So before you know it, he was 40 miles an hour across the parking lot, went up and over the median, because we were in a corner spot, went up and over the tree in the median, hit our car, knocked me over. And what we believe is that I was holding onto the handle um, at the time that it took place. And so it threw me to the ground. I tumbled underneath the truck. It ran over me diagonally and tore my spleen. I've got a tire track scar on my stomach today and continued on to completely sever my left arm. So this is where it came off and it threw it 10 feet away from me in the parking lot. Fortunately, my guardian angel was there and she walked out of the parking lot. It was a nurse who watched the whole thing happen and she knew exactly what to do. So within minutes, she was there to stop the bleeding and focus on saving my life. But she also was there to instruct some bystanders to run into the Walmart, grab a cooler and fill it with ice from the convenience center. And my arm was on ice within minutes. And this wow. was August 10th um, in 115 degree heat in Phoenix, Arizona, while we're laying on the asphalt, which adds even more. And the first uh, ambulance that got called actually got into a car accident. So as if it wasn't bad enough, it started this whole process of really just starting to recognize how do we put this to how do we put this kid back together? And so um, that was kind of the beginning of my story. And I won't bore you with some of the other details in the middle of it, but I will tell you that a lot of those post-accident years I lived and experienced in a fog, but my parents certainly did not. They sacrificed countless hours of their own comfort ultimately to save me, right? We had three days a week of physical and occupational therapy that started at 6 a.m. And my mom had two young kids, getting them both up, get, going to do this right before school. All the hours of rubbing vitamin E oil in to make the scars soft and muscle stim and therapy for years. And so what they ingrained in me, which I didn't realize far until far later in life, is not just a concept and a lesson, but a way of living. What I learned from them is to embrace pain to avoid suffering in my life. Right. And one of the other most important things that I also experienced and what I learned is I learned not to get stuck by what had happened to me, but get moved by what I could do with it. So I learned to embrace pain to avoid suffering, and I learned to not get stuck by what had happened to me, but get moved by what I could do with it. So when, when you talk about unpacking, right, the reality of it is, is this is a great and perfect example. What I realized is I had a physically active life throughout most of my life, but as I got into my 20s and some of my activity levels started going down, my pain, my chronic pain, because the right. imbalance in my body, I don't have a lat on the left side of my back. I've got a curve in my spine. I re-injured mm -hmm. and almost lost my arm when I was 20 in a snowboarding accident, went 10 months with it hanging by my side. But what I realized early in my 20s, Tamara, was I was starting to get increased levels of pain in my back in a place that I couldn't control it. Right. And so I had to make some changes. And mm -hmm. that's when physical activity and food and nutrition and recognizing how those all correlate to where I was at, I was starting to experience suffering. The pain was so bad. Right. And so what I realized, if I keep myself lean, if I keep myself active, if I keep my back as strong and stabilized as possible, if I keep all of my muscle structure in a good place, if I can do this regularly consistently and I can move, then that suffering just becomes mm -hmm. an annoyance, right? It's no right. longer suffering. And I can mm -hmm. put myself in that position. So, you know, this is a great example. Many, many people, right? You can make the decision to get up an hour early to work out before you go in. Your friend that you just talked about who's got a two hour routine and do this right. because right. it keeps you active and focused and energetic and, and strong. You can make that choice. You can also embrace the pain in doing so. Or you can lay in bed for an extra hour and the compound effect that over time is gonna ultimately result in aches and pains and a sedentary lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And that is suffering, right? Mm -hmm. And so, that's kind of a big concept and philosophy in my life. And that's just been influenced in so many of the things that I've done, largely because of the lessons that were ingrained in me by the way I was brought up and the experiences I had. So, Wow. I, I mean, I am right now just even hearing more of the story and how it unfolds. And thank you for being such a good storyteller, because that's one of the things you do. You get up on stage, you talk, you yeah. you share, you you are out there to motivate and inspire. And you do you do. And and we're going to go into that and in telling the story. I, I, I feel as though I'm there. And, and I hope that those that are watching the show, please hashtag live, hashtag replay. Please tell us what you got from that. Because where we're going today, the trip that we're taking today on Service Heroes is that we are, we are 
we are highlighting Brian, but I also am going to encourage, and I have a feeling Brian is going to encourage with me and stand in unity with me that we are going to encourage all of you to find the service hero inside of yeah. you today, because that's what both of us are all about in the way that we see our missions in this world. And, and that's why I, I felt like, okay, yeah, I can just kind of like put it out there and he'll be like, yeah, okay, we're good yeah, with that's, that. That's that. Absolutely. hundred yeah, percent. Everything good. starts and ends with each one of us. Right. Absolutely. And so, you know, I recognize that I have a very unique story. Yeah. Um, but what I've realized in all my time of doing this is that we all have unique stories. Yes, so what's really important is that we take the time to pause and recognize what are the lessons that we can learn from those stories. And we need to move those into conscious awareness. And then we have to become intentional with how do we apply those stories into our lives? And how do we tap into the collective wisdom of all of our stories? Because again, as is the case in anything in this world, it all starts and ends with human connection. It all starts and ends with us. And so if we can find ways to meaningfully use our stories to help move ourselves through this world, our stories can also provide perspective, motivation, and direction for others. And we can learn and grow and shorten the curve for struggles that others might be experiencing. And so that's what's really important in this is to find a way to recognize that we've all been kind of knocked out of autopilot right now. We're in uncharted territory and we've got to recognize how do we become as aware and intentional in everything that we do so that we are strong and healthy and that we collectively are strong and healthy. I want to recognize Helene, something that she just said right now. Every time I come to this show, I learn more of me than I knew. Thank you for sharing this today. I appreciate you for this and doing this. And you know, and uh, I appreciate you sharing that Helene, because that's what this is all about. It is to help us to realize that we can make a difference collectively. And I love that the collective, the connections and the intention to do so and taking that moment in time. And I've heard that from many of the service heroes that I've had on since this event in the world has been taking place. That is a common thread. That is a common message that is being shared that this is a time for us to slow down and to possibly revisit ourselves, to learn something about ourselves right. and then and, and to take that moment and reflect because the autopilot, I like that. I like that that phrase there because m many do. Lately, you know, it's like I, I went, I, we don't go many places, right? Very often anymore. <laughs> but I was in a car with someone and, and we were going somewhere that was quote unquote approved and all of this, you know, and cause I'm in the Southern California marketplace. And so we went into lockdown earlier than some and all of a sudden I'm noticing there's kind of an autopilot situation going on. And I'm like, where are you going? And it snapped that person out of out yep. of it. And it was like, oh my goodness, I was going somewhere else because that's what I normally do. Yep. We're out of the norm right now. And so I, I, it was such an interesting experience. So we talked about that and how, you know, wow, yeah, we're being drop kicked into a new reality. And, and we can reinvent ourselves through this. We can slow down. We can get to know ourselves. And then- You're exactly right. I mean, the reality of it is it's like, you know, so there was a study that was done back in 1986. And for whatever reason, I'm having a brain block on the, the doctor who ran it. But it was really on this idea of self-awareness, right? And the unconscious versus the conscious mind. And the stat that jumped out for me in that study, one of the biggest takeaways is that our minds process 11 million bits of information per second, but we're only consciously aware of about 40. And so what that yeah. says is that we're largely led by the unconscious. So on this idea right. of what we're talking about, we are products of the patterns, habits, and things and how they unfold in our lives, the conditioning that takes place. To your point, those autopilot moments, how many people get up, get ready, go to the office, 90 minutes has passed in the morning and they have no idea what exactly happened because it was all conditioned and automated. There was no active thought process. And so you know, a whole lot of people right now not just because the heaviness and the emotion of what's going on, which is an important piece we need to pay attention to, yes, but yes. largely due to the fact that we're just experiencing fatigue in general right now. So compounded with the emotional piece that's real, but the reason we're experiencing fatigue, Tamara, is because we're having to make active decisions every minute of every day. People are adjusting to a new life, right? How many people have 
not have the opportunity to do video conferences from home, who have had to do distance learning with their kids, who've had to make dinner more nights a week than normal, who like, you name it, there is not a precedent for what's happening right now. And so there are not conditioning moments and experts in habit formation will tell you there's an upfront energy tax. What's happening right now, whether we know it or not, we are creating new patterns, new habits, new conditioning in our life, and it's creating a drain on us. So right. what we have to pay attention to though, is this is an opportunity to move the unconscious to the conscious. This is an opportunity to move to an aware state versus a lead state. And so if we're very intentional through this process, we can take toll on the things that have been contributing to our lives, whether we are aware of it or not, the things that have been draining in our lives, whether we were aware of it before or not, and mm -hmm. actually get clear on what's most important to us moving forward and be intentional with the little habits and patterns that we're creating in our days right now. Because as we put ourselves in a position to pull out of this, we've got to feel so we can heal, process all the emotion and the heaviness, but we also have to acknowledge the fact that, you know what? It's okay if I'm a little extra tired. It's okay if I give myself a little bit of extra grace because this there is no precedent. This is all mm -hmm. new. So mm -hmm. finding small incremental things that we can layer into our days each day to just start moving towards excuse me, where we ultimately want to be, that's what I hope people take from this because there's unbelievable opportunity, but we have to recognize there's a heaviness that we got to process through before we can get there. Right, right, and and I appreciate you, you you know, and I was looking here, I have a couple of your um, your memes that you put out there, um, and, and, you know, you cannot change your destination overnight, but you can change your direction overnight. Right. Live a life full of value. Um, and, and I'm going to take these down and I'm going to, uh, uh, cause I just, I, I couldn't, I usually only grab a couple and I was like, oh, you have so many great ones. Wherever you focus on grows, whatever you focus on grows. And, and here, I'm going to, I'm going to pull one more down and take one more up. And my life is my legacy. All of these all of these are things that it's like, okay, people are saying, yeah, I've heard this. I understand that. And, and yet today on April the 9th, it looks a little different than possibly it did last year, uh, you know, 2019, April the 9th, because we are in a whole different place. And when you think about legacy, I, I actually think a lot about that because of the fact that, you know, I'm a mom and I'm into family history and, you know, uh, on and on and on. And so I've always thought, OK, what is the legacy that I want to leave for my family? What is the legacy I want to leave for those around me? Well, today we all collectively as a community, as a world, get to ask that question. And right. what's cool about it is that we can actually do something about it collectively. What do we want to do now at this time in our lives that we can change the way things are done, no longer possibly be in that automated, you know, okay, I'm on autopilot. Let's get out of autopilot. Let's, yep. let's get back in the driver's seat. Let's get back and, and have a collective understanding that we intentionally want to change the way things are being done and leave a legacy. Yep out of what is happening and 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 we do not want to diminish what is happening in fact you were telling me that you personally were touched by the events early on yeah i was do you mind sharing a little bit about that? no not at all um you know i'll i'll keep it pretty high level but i Truthfully, a month and a half ago, two months ago, I was one of those somewhat naysayers. Like, this is all blown out of proportion. This is something that's not gonna be real. Um, I didn't do my research. I didn't take the time to invest in that. But as it continued to get closer and closer and closer to what we're calling social distancing at this point, right? right. Um, I started to see much more signs. And early in March, um, I started following one of my friends from college uh, that ended up getting infected with COVID-19 was on a business trip, was at Disney World, and um, there was just a pattern that started to evolve in the communication outward. Um, ultimately, it ended in him being intubated in the ICU, and we were all hopeful that everything was gonna take place, but on the 19th of March, he actually passed away. Um, 34 years old, at the time, he was the youngest one in the country to pass of COVID-19, and so he caught 
all the attention of all the media. And it was actually a shame because everybody started pulling stuff off his Facebook page as it was a credible source and his family had to shut down the page. Um, but it made it real. Um, you know, I had not communicated with him a lot in the last couple of years. So to be perfectly honest, it's not like I was experiencing the immediate loss of something in my life, but I was definitely experiencing the loss of his soul and the connections and the memories and the things. But what made it uh, even more powerful is how real this actually was. This is going to touch people. I think by the time this is all done, you know, hopefully if we're successful in social distancing, this won't be the case. But I think by the time this is all done, there's a good chance that each one of us is going to know somebody that's been affected by COVID-19. Um, I think there's a really good chance that the impact of this can be greater and longer than many of us expected in the very beginning. And so I just use that as an opportunity, frankly, to kind of leverage and wake up other parts of the society to recognize that this is real. We originally thought it was our grandparents, right, disease, and that, that, that many of us who were between the ages of 30 and 60 would be perfectly well, you know, fine, but that's not how it's turning out to be. And we're recognizing that there's a lot of people that are, are getting hit by this. So, um, you know, I struggled right away to recognize like, what is it exactly that I was experiencing? And I read an article a couple of weeks ago that really started to bring this home. A lot of what we were all experiencing in the very beginning, whether we chose to see it that way or not, was grief. Mm. We were grieving the loss of life as we knew it. We were grieving the uncertainty of life that we believed our future was gonna look like. We're grieving the loss of, of finances. Right. We know that a number of people have been impacted financially. Geez, you look at the numbers and up to this point right now, there was three point three million people who, who applied for un unemployment three weeks ago. Six point nine the following week. And this last week was six point six. The largest week in our history in the United States was nine hundred eighty seven thousand before that was in the mid 80s. So we've had 15 million people nearly. Right. I didn't do the math in my head, but it's roughly close to that apply for unemployment in a matter of three weeks of this happening. So we're experiencing the loss of certainty. We're experiencing the loss of like our friends being impacted by this. We're experiencing the loss of lives around us, whether we know them or not. And so just recognize there's stages to grief. And we got to give, again, that goes back to my point on giving ourselves the permission to process um, mm -hmm. truthfully, right? I was impacted by this. It rattled me in the first couple of weeks. It didn't hit me right away on the day that it happened, but the following week, it sent me into a dark place. And I had to really apply a lot of effort emotionally, mentally, spiritually to start incrementally getting myself to get back up because those early indications of depression hit me hard. And, you know, I'm just going to be vulnerable when I tell the world this, like none of us are impervious. I work with people to make sure they're strong mentally, emotionally, spiritually. Like I try to get people to be their most authentic selves and make sure that they're really in a great place and implementing the daily practices they can to embrace that. Guess what? Even though I do this, I'm impacted by this, right? We are all impacted by this. And so um, I think that's really the big takeaway is I just want people to recognize there's a lot of people who are suppressing, mm -hmm, actually mm -hmm. happening, aren't processing or acknowledging, or they're like, oh, this sucks. But then all of a sudden they realize they're watching four and a half hours of Netflix or they're eating everything in sight because it's a way to deal and process. But what I'm encouraging people to do is, you know what, give yourself grace. You might watch a little more TV than normal. You might eat a little bit more than normal. That's okay, right? Everything's okay in moderation and recognize that right now we need that. But yeah, my friend, losing my friend made it real for me. And it made it real for me to know that any of us can and will be impacted by this. So it's our own social responsibility to do things necessary we can to try to eliminate the spread, frankly. Right, right. And thank you for sharing that because, you know, the when you shared with me before we went live about your friend and the age because you know in truth i have <laughs> wink wink i have kids that are that age and yeah. and you know and when all of this started of course i immediately went to my community the those that we serve that are affected by cancer one way or another and you know and 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 yes we know that anybody that's in the active treatment right now they are one of the ones that we need to really be protecting right. and so i went there immediately however when you were talking about your friend and the age and everything i'm thinking okay ah family we have family you have yep. friend you know, this was your friend one of my board members just lost his mentor um yep. two days ago and 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 then created something for it because it was saying that you know i 
all of a sudden felt lost that you know this person felt lost and yeah. and didn't know how to process it and so actually put it in you know put yeah. that energy into a, a creative place we are and and that is part of what being a servant being a service hero being someone that has been a servant for a while and you are and you serve quite a few different types of communities and we're going to talk about that in a moment and how others can also do the same when when you start to realize that right now collectively and and i like the way you put that even though it's hard to hear is that in the end it's going to be like those numbers with cancer you know one in every two right. one in every three and then you have that person that is their friend and then you have a, 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 a system, a program that helps both, that's 100% of everybody in the world, basically. Right. We now are in a situation with COVID that it's basically 100% of the world, we need to be aware, we need to be following common sense, we need to be flattening the curve, all of the words that they use and they're educating yeah. us. However, with that said, I love how you put this, is give ourselves grace give ourselves that ability to say okay right now i'm feeling this and it is okay to be feeling this yep and and then be able to and i love again a lot of what you share on your page i can i will is a mindset yep and and i thought how beautiful is that because you know i can I will. And uh, Chemo Buddies for Life, one of the songs that's been created for our community, it started as um, I will, I will. And now it's I can, we will. You know, yeah. I can and we will. Yeah. And, and I thought, oh, I love this mindset because I can, I can. And yeah, I may be behind the walls right now. I may be behind the door. I might be behind the glass for my own protection. However, I will, and then collectively, we will get through this together. And we can be as strong as that lion is right there. That's right. But, but the part I want to acknowledge is that it's an evolution. Yes, absolutely. There's not a, a final destination in every case. And... So there's this there's this new thought that's been kind of flowing through my head, and I actually just talked about this on the, the last call I was on right before this. So it might come out a little raw, but bear with me for a second because I think it's relevant at the moment. Um, in the very beginning of this, I think what was interesting is I think what we were all experiencing as well was just the uncertainty that was starting to be created in our life. And uncertainty causes fear and shame and like inaction and all these things, right? And I think uh, in uncertainty in the very beginning is like, okay, well, is this real? Like, are we just social distancing for purpose of doing it? What does our future look like? What's going to happen to the economy? What's going to happen? Like, and the reality of it is, I think we are now shifting to a certain place. We are certain that this is happening. Yeah. And so what's really interesting is that the only thing certain right now is uncertainty. And we've yeah. gone through this evolution of being uncertain on whether or not this was our new reality to we are certain that this is our new reality. Here's the crazy part about this thought process though. So follow, follow with me for a second. Now that we're becoming certain that this is our reality, we're also becoming uncertain in our certainty because we don't know what the future looks like. Yeah. We don't know what's gonna happen, but here's the key to all of that. Uh, a phenomenal book based on, on fear. It's called Feel the Fear and Do It Anyway, and it's by Dr. Susan Jeffers. And I'm gonna butcher the, 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 the premise of it, uh, the exact three layers, but it connects to this thought. She basically layers out that there's multiple levels to fear. And the most basic fundamental level, the root of it all, is the question, can I handle it? Oh, that's good. If we overcome that, then it's not about avoiding fear, shutting down fear. It's about feeling the fear and doing it anyway. <sighs> and so on this concept of uncertainty, I want to extend that thought process because I think what we can be clear on right now, what we can be certain on right now is in this state of uncertainty, I am 100% certain we will all be okay. Right. We can handle this. We can pull together to do this. And so despite the fact that we have less ability than ever to strategically plan and look into the future and recognize what this is gonna force us to do is slow down, yeah. 
and recognize what's right in front of us, to be where our feet are and recognize that moment by moment, day by day, week by week, month by month, we will handle this. So I, I, I want to recognize that the uncertainty that started is actually going to give us an element of certainty throughout this. And as long as we can recognize that like the I can, I will, it's a mindset, it's the same thing here. I am 100% certain we will be okay. We will get through this. We've got to focus on how do we lift each other in this time? How do we make ourselves as strong as possible so that that is a certainty? I love it. Very well said. And and I love the way you put that all together because you know uh, what I'm thinking of, it reminds me of that, the when, when, back in the day, you know, I know that I don't know. I, you know, it's like, okay, that awareness. Okay. Yep. Now I have an awareness that I don't, I don't really know, but I know that I will know. And, you know, and it's, it's, it's that evolution and getting through this. And, and as they say, when you're in any kind of a, a trauma situation, that to acknowledge it is the start of healing from it. And, exactly right. and, and right now, and the, the whole evolution of the fear factor that you were talking about, that brings in so much of, of what I want to go into now, because you you were telling me about an email campaign that you had not long ago. And there are so many people that are being affected by this throughout the world that are in different places. You know, we, we, mm -hmm. it's like anything in life. We, we show up from where we were, you know, we show up that day yep. where we are right. And there are many that are coming to this situation that are, are more challenged, if you will, because of where they were when yep. it all started. And and we need to acknowledge that, guys, because there's some that, uh, and I will say, you know, that there are those that went out there and did whatever they did. We're not going to go there right now. You do what you needed to do. And if you went and you bought a bunch of toilet paper and then you kept it, okay, fine. You shared it, okay, fine. We're not going to go there right now. However, where I do want to go in all of this, and I want to I want to talk about what it is that you decided to do, and that is there are those people that couldn't go and just go buy the toilet paper, even though they needed it, and they probably yep. needed it the day before they found out about this, because yep. there are challenged. There are those people that are, and and I actually had to bring some people back to my home, actually, that we're in this situation that paycheck to paycheck or not even quite paycheck to paycheck, yep. you know, that are, 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 there's those new terminologies that, that we've been learning as a social society. And that is food insecurity. Right. And, and so many that are living in homeless. Yes. Homeless can be a choice, but there are times it's not a choice. That's right. And, that population right now is a very, um, it, they're at risk too. And I don't know that they're necessarily getting quote unquote, the press that, that should be and the recognition that, that they should be getting because of the fact that, you know, social distancing is not necessarily even a possibility for some because they're, they're like, yeah, okay. That would be a luxury right now. I am, yeah. I am looking forward to getting through with my life where I have something to eat that I can be protected from the elements. We have a cold front that's taking place. We have tornadoes that have just hit the ground. We have a variety of things that are happening today on April the 9th, 2020 throughout the United States and throughout the world that our environments are not necessarily in a great place for someone that's having these issues and you decided to do something. Let's talk about that. Yeah. So again, I'm, I appreciate the caveat you gave in the front of the call. I will reiterate that because as you know, I, uh, I don't typically like to talk externally about a lot of the stuff that I do. So I will share this only um, not to impress, but to impress upon the point that we're making here. And, and I think that's a really important distinction. So just think through all this, you know, again, I won't go into crazy detail, but fear oftentimes manifests in a scarcity mindset. Mm -hmm. 
we saw that, right? We saw people going out and trying to stock up on everything and not just getting what they need, but getting like far beyond what they need. Um, and so really thinking much more about themselves than kind of the collective good. And how do we actually get through this together? Because the reality of it is there's limited resources and we've seen the impact of that, right? Um, and so what I do often is just out, outwardly reach, right? So I look for people to connect with, do check-ins, see how they're doing. And in this time more than ever, I'm doing that at an even higher frequency. One of the organizations that I'm involved with is an organization called St. Vincent de Paul. Um, and St. Vincent de Paul has a really cool history. I won't go into all that detail, but the one in Phoenix is actually the largest St. Vincent de Paul in the world. Really? And so, yeah, and, they, um, and it's a really phenomenal story. And in another, in another context, we can talk about this. Okay, we will. Um, we'll we'll I, bring you back on that. Okay. Cool. I, I mean, it's phenomenal. And I, frankly, I think you should talk to their chief strategy officer, one of the best development nonprofit minds on the planet, in my opinion, and has really changed the trajectory of that organization. Okay. Six years ago, I joined and, and helped create what we called the Vinnies, which is an uh, advisory group that was really to help kind of rebrand and refocus on the new area for this organization. And in that time, this, this six years, this group has been responsible for helping lead a $20 million capital campaign, uh, building an urban farm that's literally right in the middle of the city that produces 80,000 pounds of organic food every single year developing a 38,000 square foot building. And again, I'm saying this very intentionally as the group and the organization and the staff did this, right, right. okay? But it's an area that we serve and they focus primarily on the working poor, right? Those most vulnerable people in our society, the ones that need help, often it's just a paycheck uh, gap or paying a power bill to get them back on their feet. And they focus so much on sustainability versus dependability and getting people to stand on their own two feet. and. Shockingly, to your point, the majority of people that they serve are those that don't actually want the help, but they yeah. need them. And so right. they put themselves yeah. in a place where they set aside their own ego and do what they need to do for their families and for society. Most of these folks in St. Vincent de Paul, the four primary areas they focus is um, feed, clothe, house, and heal. So for the working poor, they focus in those four areas. So there's a medical and dental clinic. They've got housing options. They, they provide more food into the community than a lot of the people here. Um, and they typically serve 4,500 meals per day um, in their main dining center. So that just shows the general volume. They've got the largest commercial kitchen in the state of Arizona as a nonprofit, which is crazy to think about. Yeah. So if you're entering into this, right? I see this behavior starting to manifest in scarcity mindset. And my wife and I have always had a, a belief um, in the 14 years we've been together that it's like give until it hurts, right? Mm -hmm. So give to a place where it's like we actually feel the pain a little bit because that is actually, in my opinion, meaning. And I don't, that's not necessarily always financial, but in this case, it was financial. Um, and so I reached out and I talked to the chief strategy officer and I said, what are your guys' biggest needs right now? How is this impacting you guys? How are you shutting down? Because people sleep in your facilities, they bring their families to dine in your facilities, like what's happening? And they started embracing the social distancing element. And he said, you know, we serve our people with such dignity, typically. Their family dining center is literally, they are greeted at the door with a menu. The family is seated. They are given options so that it replicates as much as they can a dining experience versus going to a food kitchen, right? And so they are so focused on high touch, maintaining dignity, getting people back on their feet. And he said, so the part that's breaking my heart more than anything is that everything we have to do now immediately removes some of that dignity. And we're focusing on how do we actually serve people and we have to package these meals to go and people are picking them up at the curb. But he said, what's interesting is we actually saw the early indications on this because as it started creating noise, people weren't necessarily thinking about, okay, I need toilet paper or I need this. They're thinking about, okay, if I can't get access to food, can I go now before it's gone? And can I get a meal for my family before I know I'm gonna need it in two weeks? Can I extend mm -hmm. my resources that I currently have? So instead of stocking up on resources, they're looking at how do I extend my resources as long as possible using all the things that are, are, are needed. So I said, what's your greatest need right now? And he said, typically I don't say this, but money. Because mm -hmm. right now we can't serve with the dignity, we can't be as interpersonal, but we need the money. And so I said, great, awesome, let's do it. I walked, um, or I, I basically, processed that for a day. And then I structured an email to our advisory committee the next day that outlined literally what is happening, right? We're worried about, are we going to have toilet paper a week from now? They're worried about, can I even feed myself or my family today? We're worried about, are we potentially going to lose our jobs? Most of these are frontline workers in minimum wage jobs. They're probably already losing their job or have, and they don't have any resources to sustain. And so I just outlined all these different ways of looking at how we're experiencing this, but how blessed we actually are. And can we find in our hearts to give? 
And so that was one of the rare scenarios where I actually volunteered and said, I'm going to donate a certain amount of money and I'd ask you guys all to match. And if you match and we raise X, then I'm going to donate. I'm going to double down on my donation and I'll do it twice. And so I was just blown away, frankly, because in three days, this group of 25 to 30 people raised about $15,000 and a number of people gave 500, 1,000, $750. And we had people who gave 50 because that's all they could give. And awesome, right? Like they embrace the idea of if and how I can help and literally giving until it hurt for themselves. And so I couldn't be more proud to be associated with these folks because I, I threw a challenge out. They all stepped up. And in fact, two weeks later, we have more donations still coming in and they're talking about how do we get a second energy behind this? Well, you know what that $15,000 provided is pretty significant because to serve and operate in that dining room for one day costs $5,500. So my challenge was, can we raise $5,500? And then it turned into $11,000. And now it's turned into, well, we're gonna probably provide three days in the dining hall, which is gonna be anywhere between 15 and 20,000 meals that this group was able to provide by operating from an abundant mindset, by operating from a place that they had perspective and realized that, you know what? Yeah, this does suck for all of us, mm -hmm. but it sucked really bad for a lot more. And mm -hmm. if our most vulnerable population, if the bottom of our society falls out, especially in this time, mm -hmm. we all feel it even more so. So how do we stabilize the most vulnerable people in our society now and try to help get them through this? Um, and if we shift our mindsets to a place of giving versus a place of taking in this time, mm -hmm. I think the society is going to shift and we're going to be in a lot better place. So I, I just viewed it as a way to hopefully help. And fortunately it turned out the outcome is it absolutely helped. You know, and, and thank you for sharing this. And that's why I did preface the whole show in the very beginning that we're going to be talking about some, uh, some strategies, some actual implementing of, of making a difference. And we're going to be using some real stories and many people that are out there in the front lines making a difference don't necessarily want to sometimes toot that own, own horn because that's not who they are. That's not why they serve. Typically, they serve because they are not that type of a person. And so thank you for opening up because right now I'm I'm calling upon and if you guys are getting the message right now and I really want you to share this out. We need to be sharing it out to those people that are going to listen to what Brian has done and other service heroes are doing now and say, OK, I'm feeling inspired. I can and I will serve here. We all have a service hero inside of us. And if we're going to, not if though, you heard him say, when we are going to get through this, but yeah. we need to get through this. And when we were talking about the legacy, this is a time for all of us to step up and do our smart part. You don't have to be the leader if nope. you feel inspired to be, yes, it's a yep. calling. However, to be a part in whatever way you feel inspired. And I like the way you put it, that you and your wife made a decision together years and years ago that you were going to collectively help and you were going to help until you felt it because then you knew that you were going to be making a difference out there in the yep. world. And and I know that you are, and I want to. I want to go one more place uh, before we start to wrap. Can this I up. say one more thing on this point? I don't yes, mean to interrupt yes. you, but what you just said, I think, is really powerful, and I wanted to jump on it. I forget where the originator of this quote came from, but this is the most relevant time as ever. Not everybody has the ability to change the world, but everybody has the ability to change their own world. Yes. And so this idea of giving and reaching out it might not be the same way that I've done it. It might not be through an organization. It might not be raising money. It might not be having impact on tens of thousands of lives, but you can find people in your world right now that who need the help, who are isolated and solo and need that human connection. There are ways that you can show appreciation for our frontline first responders and healthcare staff that you don't even have to leave your house. So that would be my challenge on that is yes, embrace the concept, but recognize it doesn't matter how big or how small because your world is all that matters right now. And if we all collectively impact our world, we change the world together. Absolutely, completely, 100%. Thank you for uh, wrapping that up with a nice bow because the, 
the, the, the concept here in my mind and what comes to me right now, and I'm sure many of you are feeling like, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm getting that fire in my belly. I'm feeling this Twitter in my heart. I'm feeling like, you know, pins and needles because you're waking up to the fact that yes, you can do what you can do. And I'm thinking of, of some acts of service, even in my own home. And that is as simple as helping one person or our animal and you know it's like okay an extra moment in time of doing something nice right. that changed the whole dynamics of the whole energy of the home that right. one act and and we sometimes don't give ourselves the credit that that actually could make a big huge difference it shifted the whole energy and That's exactly right and, and that is where each one of us can make that difference. And I keep, I bring this card up a lot, but something as simple as a card that I received right. from someone I didn't even know, but I had my name on the rolls and they just checked to see how I was doing. That meant so much to me. I don't know this person. However, I felt loved. I felt right. cared for. And it was a huge thought. And, and uh, you know, I, I've now talked about it a lot because it made such a big Im impact in my world. Of course. And now, you, you know, you mentioned something that you did with St. Vincent de Paul. You also did that within the area that I serve with cancer. You just, and I love this. You're like a social disruptor in a way, you know, get, get in there and let's make things Let's bring a new spin on things. You decided to get involved with uh, an organization that serves people that are affected by cancer, didn't you? Yeah, um, so I'll address what you just said uh, first because I don't know that I'm a social disruptor, but I do like to come into places and build and grow. And I only dedicate my time with organizations that I think I can have profound and sustainable change within their organization. If I don't, okay. if I can't create an inflection point, if I can't like actually change the trajectory, it's not something I'm gonna do because I know that although I wouldn't describe myself as a social disruptor, I am a challenger and I am someone that's going to look for ways to optimize, grow and find opportunity. Um, okay. And so it, it's with American Cancer Society. Yes. And truthfully, um, I said no to them for a long time. Um, I, we've all been impacted by cancer. It's something that I, I'm passionate about for a variety of reasons. Um, and I like to build new things and I like to make major shifts. And so they approached me, I don't know, five or six years ago to help them launch their Real Men Wear Pink campaign, which was really to focus on bringing men collectively into the fight against breast cancer and focusing on how we can be a part of the solution. So. What they started with was this idea that, and I, I'm forgetting the numbers off the top of my head, so if these are directionally accurate, everyone, please forgive me, but there's something like 230,000 women a year that get diagnosed with breast cancer. And there's 2,300 men a year that get diagnosed with breast cancer. And so part of the initial focus on the campaign was like, we gotta get men to be a part of the fight because they're impacted. And I said, yeah, you're right, but the piece we've got to recognize here is they're already impacted because the 230,000 women make the 2,300 men deal in comparison, but there are mothers, our daughters, our sisters, our wives, our right, everything. And so mm -hmm. we already should be a part of the fight, but what they noticed was a large percentage of people who were donating and supporting the cause were women. We didn't have men as active and involved in the fight against breast cancer as we should. And so this was a, a way to get men active in communities to raise awareness, funds, and just general awareness around we're all impacted by this. Whether men get diagnosed or not is irrelevant. It's relevant, but my point is it pales in comparison to the fact that we're all impacted and we all are in this fight together. So I started with that and we had a lot of success and it was fun. We raised a lot of money in a course of a very short month um, and that was, that was great. Um, so immediately they started to ask me to do some different things for the organization, uh, be on their advisory board, run the board, and I, I just said no. And the biggest reason I said no is because ACS for a long time was too institutionalized. ACS yeah. was very centralized. And this happened 10, 15 years ago when they went through a reorganization, they redefined their areas. They focused on how do we use economies of scale and how do we fight cancer? But what it did was two things. One, it focused on really fighting cancer the same way in every community. And we know that's not real. We know the cancer prevalence is different. We know that there's, um, social disparities of health, even within our own communities, there's all these different components to cancer. And so 
fighting cancer in a uniform way is just not going to work. And they relied so heavily on one of the greatest fundraisers that's ever existed in our world, Relay for Life, right? And they got too comfortable with that being a revenue generation for them. And what they started to realize is the world was shifting. How we were going to focus and raise dollars was shifting. There was less engagement in it and revenue started to decline. And so a few years before I got involved, some of the only positive profit that they posted was actually by liquidating the assets. And I say all this totally transparently because people who are involved in ACS either should know this or do know this. And the rest of the community should know because what they realized is we're not on the right path. So they right. had to reorganize and refocus and they shifted a lot more control back to volunteer leaders. They started to shift everything back into the local communities. And so when that happened, I saw a window of opportunity. Right. This is a place that I can have profound and sustainable change potentially within the organization. And so I agreed to lead the area board for Arizona, New Mexico and parts of Texas and recruit high level individuals so that we could go through essentially a rebranding effort for ACS within our own local communities and mm -hmm. help recognize that it's not a matter of if, but when we are impacted by cancer, we're all in the fight together. And to be able to recognize too, that the actions and behaviors in our life are often things that manifest into cancer. So we put around a campaign around the first two decades of life to look at skin cancer, um, cervical cancer, um, obesity related cancers and lung related mm -hmm. cancers, because those are all active decisions that we can make. And we started to recognize how do we leverage our different partnerships because we've got the Heart Association and the Diabetes Association. We're all attacking these same lifestyle issues. So how do we cooperate and collaborate with people who are chasing the same types of behaviors that are just manifesting in different ways in different people? So we put a lot of smart people around the table, people way smarter than me. And we sat down and we just started to think strategically about how do we do this? Are we serving people in the right way? Is ACS still relevant? Where do we position ourselves so that we can maintain relevance? Because we do a lot that people don't even know about. Right. And so um, it's been a really fun opportunity, but what it's also doing is it's forced at a national level now them to focus on better data back in the local societies to be able to actually understand on local P&Ls, how do we make decisions? What's working in this area versus this area might be different. And how do we make decisions both on data and on people so that we can know from a P&L perspective, you know what, in this market, we might not be in the housing game. Hope Lodge might not be the most relevant. We might not be in the transportation game to get people to services because that's not really a need here based on the way this certain area is focused. But where we can offer a lot of value is in patient navigation. We can offer a lot of value in research. We can offer a lot. Of, and so it's really about putting the right solutions in the right markets for ACS. And I'm really excited about what the future looks like because it's taken a couple of years now, but we're starting to see the turn of the tide yeah. and, and it's been fun. So I did, I led that board for two years. I just rolled off um, because I think it's, I'm, I'm a big believer in fresh leadership as well. And I'm just unbelievably pleased with my successors. They're going to take this to the next level. So, and I want to thank you for that because, you know, I will tell you this as a, a cancer survivor that, and, and, in total disclosure, I am now over five years. And so, you know, you put it back then. So not quite six years ago when I was going through it, many of us that were you know going through it together my little graduating class if you will we didn't have the best opinion at that time and and it needed to have some shifting and changing and yet you, you what is fair though is that many of us are alive because of the work that's been done and so it's like how do you how do you take that branding out there and 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 help people to understand that they're they are there for the right reasons and it's exactly on the grassroots level it is on the regional it's you know in your backyard it yep. is in your hometown and so i love the way that you did this i love what you you know what you're all about because it so needed that type of a branding because when you start diving in oh yeah no they're they've got a lot going on they they yeah. We really do. And we need to be appreciative. And I love also because I'm a big believer in collaboration. And I love the fact that you were collaborative about it in bringing the different groups, because in truth, guys, it is like even Western medicine versus Eastern medicine. Our bodies yeah. are our bodies. And yet we have so many specialty doctors. Well, when you start looking at it, our body is our body, our heart and our soul. And, and when we don't, you know, differentiate our, our, <laughs> our lungs from our arm, from our eyeballs, we realize, okay, this is all Tamara, 
you know, under the umbrella of Tamara. That's where all of these nonprofits, all of these people, and it goes back to what is happening today. We as a community, as a global community, what is our legacy coming out of COVID? And how can we collaboratively work together to take care of those people that are at risk right now, today? Today, there are those people that are saying, Brian, that sounds great, but I don't even know if I'm, you know, I'm having to choose being hungry or feeding my child. I'm, I, it's raining outside and I have, I don't even have an umbrella, let alone a roof. You know, these are real issues that we need to, as a human race, be able to say, okay, what can I do about it? I can be kind to an animal in my home and that's going to change. That's going to create a domino effect and how that may actually change the world. That's right. It's an energy. We have to take action on doing it, right? Absolutely. I think it's one thing to think about it. I think it's one thing to conceptualize it, talk about it. It all sounds great. None of it matters until we take action. And so I think it just, it's, it's really about asking yourself, what can you give? Right. Right. Even if it's literally a dollar or even if it's a phone call or even if it's a a LinkedIn or Facebook message, a handwritten note, whatever the case may be, people right now are suffering. And so going back to my original point here, if we can embrace the pain of the reality that we're in, we can embrace the pain of recognizing that we have to take action and do things that are outside of our normal right now. We have to embrace the pain of making extra effort, even when we don't want to, because we're ourselves having a hard time picking up the phone and checking in to see how other people are doing, right? We've got to embrace that pain to eliminate and reduce the amount of suffering that we're one experiencing now. And certainly that if we aren't intentional about right now, we'll manifest into much greater suffering on the back end of this. And right. so please, 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 just that's what I would ask everybody, take action and let's just start working towards this together. Perfect. Well, as we close, because we're at the top of the hour right now, and this has been a wonderful and a wonderful discussion, and I do want to bring you back and so we can get dive deeper into some of the other areas that we were touching on and we just don't have the time to do it right now. Yep. Because you you really are a service hero and and at you know. What is the last little nugget you would like to leave everybody with? You know, it's going to connect to everything I've already said, but it's just something to remember. Everything in this world begins and ends with ourselves, right? And so focus inward first. Make sure that you get yourself spiritually, mentally, emotionally strong during this time because that's the only way you can put yourself in a position to help. And so if you're not in a place to do that right now to actually think outside of yourself, that's okay. Start inward because that's where it starts. And once we get ourselves to a place where we can feel, we can heal, we can move through this, that's where we all start to rise. And so give yourself the grace and just remember a lot of the points that we talked about today, but it starts and ends with us. And that's inside and that's with our actions, that's with our thoughts, that's with our emotions. So just recognize that you're in control of you and nobody else. So focus on the things you can do to get yourself in a good place. And I also wanna say real quick, you are so gracious to tell everybody else that they're service heroes. You are a service hero, my friend. All the things that you do, bringing other people in to share stories and provide perspective, motivation, and direction, you are a service hero. And so thank you for what you're doing. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That means a lot to me. Thank you. Well, as we close today on April the 9th, 2020, the Service Hero Show, 365 Days of Awesome, celebrate success through service. Brian Bogert, I want to thank you for being the service hero that you are, for bringing an education to us through inspiration and not only your words, but your actions, what it is that you have been dedicated with your life, taking your story, sharing it with us, and then taking us through what it is that you're doing and then how we can collectively with our healing ourselves and then reaching out to others to help them to do the same, how we can change the focus of this world and leave a legacy that this day, April 9th, 2020, will be a time where people will say, wow, things changed. And 
Brian helped me to find out I have a service hero inside of me. So I want to say thank you for being an example to me. Thank have you. a great day, everybody. And and you know, if you have not uh, anybody that has been affected by cancer, or if you're feeling isolated and alone, join our community at Chemo Buddies for Life. Uh, we have a closed group. And tonight we're going to be talking about Thankful Thursday. It's going to be led by Carol Brown and Barbara Beckley, two of our favorite leaders and volunteers. And we're going to be talking about being grateful and thankful and how we can help to take that out there and make it a better place for others and so you know how appropriate how appropriate to piggyback off of today all right go out there and make it a great day guys bye take care